Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as once again, as always, God has blessed us with a new week that wasn't promised to us. And so as we come into this new week, I pray that this finds you blessed and it finds you healthy and it finds you challenged and it finds you growing. And, you know, we're entering into the week of Christmas and I'm excited because Last night we had the opportunity, we got the grandbabies this weekend, so, and we went for a ride and we drove around. We probably saw like 200 houses looking to see the Christmas lights and all this other kind of stuff. And so while they're oohing and on in the back seat and everything like that, this is what I was doing. I was looking to see how many manger scenes I've seen, how many nativity scenes, you know, right? So out of about 200 houses, I saw maybe three to four. And on top of that, I also counted the number of things that had a biblical reference to it. So I saw the sign joy four times out of 200 houses. Now here's the funny thing, right? If joy only really existed in two and four houses, then we are in a world of hurt. (laughs) But you had everything under the sun at their houses were elaborately done up. It was beautiful and pretty. I mean, you know, you're kind of get all giddy and so forth, right? But none of that has anything to do with the gift of Christmas. The two closest things is the nativity scene and joy. That was the thing. I'm like, and now you put those two together, you got eight places out of 200 that had anything to do with the true aspects of Christmas. What does that say about us as a, as, as, as a country? What does it say about us as a people? See, we want to believe that we have all these good Christian values and so forth, but when you look for the evidence of it, you cannot find it. Somebody needs to say something. And so I'm excited when I get to talk about the true story of Christmas. You know, excuse me, when you think about that journey to Bethlehem, for a pregnant woman that was probably in the ninth month because they say when she got there, she was ready to go, right? It was a 70 mile journey, y'all. And I want you to get it in your mind. Many of all the women that's ever been pregnant will tell you when it's time to drop, I don't want to go more than two feet, less long 70 miles on an animal. <laughs> but this is the real aspect of what Chris said. It takes a woman to tell this part of the story, right? But it, you understand that this was not a comfortable experience. But yet she goes through it. And then when she's there and she's in the throes of getting ready to have this child, they're rushing around going, hey, is there room? My wife's pregnant and she's about ready to drop. Can you can you do something? And they go, nope, no room here. See, that's the story. The world didn't even want to make room for him then. Let's long make room for him now. Come on now. And so he finds himself we, we call it a, 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 in a manger, you know, in a, in a little farm area and so forth. Some people want to say it was a cave. Other people want to say it was a stable. But either way, it was outdoors. And we beautify, we, we make it, we paint it so beautifully with words when we call it a manger. The truth of it was it was a food trough for the animals. They threw some hay in there. That's the truth of the matter. Let's just call it what it is. So let's understand why our Savior would choose to come to this world in those conditions. Because you've got to realize something in this deal. He can relate to every person ever born after this. Do you get it? He is never beyond anybody in this experience. He can relate to every single person. The person that's born in the alley, he can relate to. And then he can also born, relate to those who are born in the best places of all the world because he came from the best places of all the world. And so everybody in between, he meets you right where you are. Amen. See, this is the Christmas story. So now if you have your Bible with you, we're going to talk about when he came and what joy it brought into this world. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Luke chapter uh, 2, starting at the 8th verse. Say amen when you have them, not so wait on me. Luke chapter 2, starting at the 8th verse. Amen? Amen. And it reads this way. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. I love that. Verse 11 says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Let us pray. Mighty and loving father, once again, master, this is your poor, weak and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come when your people have got themselves together once again to hear from on high. So, Master, as your servant stands, I pray for preaching power. To fill me afresh anew with your Holy Spirit, and that you bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer, and we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen and amen. This morning's sermon title is called Joy to the World. Joy to the World. And at the top of your outline, you will find this simple, beautiful word, joy. And it says joy is a positive state of contentment, confidence, and hope of the mind and heart that rises above circumstances. Y'all might want to underline that part. And focuses on the very character of God. It is the fruit of a righteous relationship with God. It is not something people can create by their own efforts. Somebody needs to say something. And so I want to simply say as we kick this off, Merry Christmas to you. I don't hear it that much today, these days, right? But Merry Christmas to you. And I want to welcome you once again and just simply say this morning we are blessed to see the introduction of true joy. You see, the world thought it knew joy prior to Christ's coming. But today you're going to see when true joy enters the world. You see, the Christmas story is about the birth of Jesus Christ. See, this miraculous birth was the greatest birth mankind will ever know. Somebody need to say something. You see, it was through the birth and life and death of Jesus Christ that the world would come to know unconditional love. Look out, y'all. It would also know salvation, true forgiveness of sins. Eternal life is because of this child coming in the manger, right? And peace with God and the peace of God. Come on now. I'm just preaching to myself right now, see? And the reconciliation with God and also underlining all of this is his love and joy. You see, the birth of the Messiah was a long-awaited prophecy. It had been prophesied about so many times, 600, 700 years before, right? The king that would sit on the throne of David, right? The Jewish world was looking for this king to be born in royal surroundings, wrapped in the best of robes and, and a palace with servants with a long line of tributaries waiting on their chance to honor him. That's what the Jewish world was looking for. See, this was man's expectation of an earthly kingdom. But God was looking for something a little more eternal. Something that was for everyone. You see, a heavenly kingdom that was not just for the Jews, but anyone that would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody need to say something. See, Jesus and God never left anybody out. <sighs> True joy entered the world in the birth of Jesus. It is that joy, that unspeakable joy. See, it's in verse 8 that Luke shares with us the first to hear this joy was some humble shepherds, right? But ask yourself the question, why shepherds? Right? Why, why, why shepherds? It says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. It says the shepherds were abiding in the fields next to Bethlehem and keeping watch over their flocks, right? So the angel was not just sent to, wasn't sent to the chief priests or the elders. Do y'all get that? The angel was not sent to the chief priests or the elders because they were not prepared to receive these tidings. It was going to fail their, 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 their sight test. That was the issue. They were expecting this royal palace, this, this huge entourage of people welcoming in the newborn king that would set the Jews free. They were looking for this earthly thing. And if they told them it was going to be laying in a manger, they would have said, you a fool. But to a company of poor shepherds who were like Jacob, 
plain men dwelling in tents. See, these patriarchs were shepherds. Moses and David were shepherds, particularly called from keeping the sheep of people, uh, uh, keeping the sheep to rule God's people. Do you get that? And so here's the thing. By this instant, God would show that he still had favor for those of that innocent employment. Somebody needs to say something. See, it's nothing wrong with being a shepherd. And here's the funny thing. Most shepherds were not educated. Probably the most educated shepherd there ever was, was Moses. Y'all get that? Everybody else was just a commoner who had a, a affinity to work with the animals. But why shepherds, right? So let's briefly consider the character of a shepherd. First of all, they were not sleeping in their beds when this news was brought. Where were they? They were abiding in the fields, right? And watching. Isn't that beautiful? What were they watching for? Making sure that nothing happened to the sheep. You see, they were employed not in acts of devotion, but in the business of their calling, shepherding. See, a true shepherd provides loving protection for his flock. Somebody need to say something. He also walks before the sheep, clearing a pathway of safety and seeks provisions that will meet their needs despite their circumstances. Are you getting the picture here? Why a shepherd this morning, right? And so he knows his sheep intimately and knows how to care for the needs. See, this is the reason why he brought it to the shepherds. The presence of the shepherd provides comfort and peace to the flock. Somebody need to say something. And Jesus himself linked his divine nature with being the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11, he says this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for what? The sheep. So you're starting to get the picture as to why God would bring this to the shepherds, right? Because, see, who better to entrust with the news of the birth of the Lamb of God than these shepherds? This is why I'm, ta I'm talking about joy to the world. They were the first to get that joy note. Wow. And I'm pretty sure there's people who look down upon them because they were shepherds. But God looked up on them. Come on now. You see, it's in verse 9. Luke goes on to tell them that the introduction of Jesus' birth came with glory. See, he says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. See, the angel of the Lord didn't just appear. Y'all realize that, right? He appeared in the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds. Y'all get that, right? It wasn't the angel's glory, but it was God. Somebody need to say something. See, there was something miraculous that was happening. It was an amazing event. This is, you can truly use the word amazing right here. And what I love about this passage of scripture is the symbolism of this great light shining in this vast darkness. It was pitch black. And then this great light appears. Do you get it? Do you see it in your mind's eye? Because see, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The light shows up. John chapter 8, verse 12, he says it this way. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Somebody needs to say something. You see, the Lord chose to first reveal the glory of Christ to these shepherds because the conditions in which they would find the Savior was not what the Jewish nation was expecting. But you see, it's in verse 10 that God tells them, do not be afraid, for there is joy. Y'all get that? It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you what? Good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. You see, the angel had to tell the shepherds not to be afraid. Back then, just like today, if the angel of the Lord appeared to us, our first reaction would be fear. The second reaction is running. Because, see, we wouldn't think he's coming in loving kindness, but of God's judgment and his wrath. You get it? But see, in, in this angel's message, it's not of judgments of the Lord but of his merciful loving kindness, the subject being a matter of great joy. You see, when you understand the true meaning of Christmas, you understand what it means about great joy. You understand what it means to have the bondage in your life 
set free because of this great Joy, you understand what it means to have peace of God and to have peace with God. See, you understand what the true meaning of Christmas is. See, the world may be going to hell in a handbasket, but you are at, in your heart and as well with your soul because you are at peace with God. If you meet him today, you will hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on in and enjoy your master's pleasures. You see. This message was not for the Jews only, but for the entire world. See, I remember back in Genesis chapter 12, third verse. It says this. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And then it says this. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, do y'all realize that the angel was for the Jews, but the star was for the Gentiles? Y'all get it? The star was for the Gentiles. See, wise men looked for the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 bears witness to this. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi, from the east arrived to, in Jerusalem, saying, verse 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Isn't this beautiful? Somebody to say something. See, that's why I'm talking about joy to the world. They saw it in the star. What they saw could have been that light where the angel said, they're going, you get it? Because it was just the glory. You see, here's the thing. You got to ask yourself, but why is it considered joy? Why? Do you understand why it's considered joy? Here's why. I'm going to relieve your pressure. Because the word became flesh. Y'all get that? The word became flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14 says it this way. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only, the one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the joy. Christ came and lived among us. He chose to be made like man. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 says this, But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness because Jesus came, hope entered a hopeless world. Because here's the deal. You don't have to no longer live in hell and then turn around and die and go to hell. Somebody needs to say something. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about joy to the world. This is the true meaning of Christmas. And then in verse 11, Luke goes on and tells us the Savior a say that a savior is born. He says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And so he says, a savior has been born to you. Isn't that personal? That's personal, right? I love that because it's personal. That relationship is always personal. It's never general. He didn't go, I was born to some people. He says, to you. And so these words of the angel are so powerful. And y'all probably have read this scripture many, many times and you've never really understood the full power of why this was such a powerful statement. Do you realize that this angel was preaching such sound theology of who Christ is and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it? See, he preached it to a level and explained it to a level that even the humble shepherds could understand it. But let me break the theology down for you just real quick. First, he said he is a savior, which is expressed in his name, Jesus. Matthew chapter one, verse 21 says this, and she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's the first part. The second piece is this. Then he is Christ, the anointed of God, the Messiah of Israel in his name. He's preaching such a beautiful theology. Then the third and the final piece is this, that he is the Lord. God manifest in the flesh and ruler of everything. Philippians chapter two, verse six says it this way. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He said it like that. That's the true meaning of it. He preached the theology of who Christ is from start to finish to some humble shepherds. 
Do you know it says that after they get, they said this to them? If you look at Luke chapter 2, verse 15 to 20, it says, And when the angels had left, the, left them and gone into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem, Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at the shepherds, at what the shepherds said to them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured upon all these things and pondered them in her heart. Verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They, first of all, you got to believe. Do you get it? You said there's a, there's a, they heard it and they accepted it, believed it, and then they acted on it. And then they gave him away. Oh, my God. Come on now. Let me take you through this. First of all, I want you to understand. Christ was given to man. That's the first part. Christ was given to man. And so he was not sent for the angels. He did not take on the nature of angels. Come on now. Amen. Lights and walls, right? But so, but of men so that he would be the lamb of God that would redeem us back unto God. Somebody needs to say something. See, this was not meant to be a secret, by the way. It was meant for, to be shared with everyone. So this is the reason why we should shout joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let the earth receive her king today. See, this is why John 3.16 shares whosoever believes. It's one of the most beautiful scriptures out there. It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, this is joy to my soul. Because it didn't put a face on it. It didn't put an ethnicity on it. It says whosoever believes. Wow. And it's in verse 12 that Luke tells the shepherds were told to, Look for a sign. He says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. They just told him, the shepherds, that this would be a sign to you. He gave them a way to confirm their faith. <sighs> Do you realize that if they had, the angels had, had spoke all this to them and the shepherds stayed there, is it faith? Because, see, we, we always get into arguments over this. See, faith without works is what? Dead. So they can say they had faith, but we believe the angel. But we're going to stay here and watch the sheep. So you see the instant connection between faith and action. He says, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. See, this was not the way the Jews envisioned their Savior King coming. Somebody need to say something, right? Who could fathom a child of such importance to the world being born in such poverty? Where is the palace? Where is the servants, right? Where is the entourage? They were expected to be told you shall find him, though a babe dressed up in robes, lying in the best house in town, lying in state with a numerous train of attendants in rich garments. But no, you will find him wrapped in a swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, which is actually a feed trough for the animals. Somebody needs to say something, man. You see, Isaiah prophesied about how the Savior would come without any earthly majesty. Isaiah 53, verse 2 says it this way. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Do y'all get the imagery of that? A root coming out of dry ground? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Do y'all, I'm going to break this down for you, right? He had no money. He had no flash. He had no glitz, no glamour, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that when it says that he has nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, he may have even been ugly. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? See, we gather around pretty people. Mm -hmm. What? They can be ugly on the inside, but they pretty on the outside. Ooh, I want to be in their presence. But do you understand what he's saying? That there was nothing about him that set him apart from anybody else other than the life that he's going to lead. Isn't that interesting? The number of times we've read this scripture but never considered it. Because we like the beautiful picture we see painted up on the walls of this beautiful, you know, facial structured Jesus. Jesus. 
And so, but here's what I know to be 113% true. That if you seek him, you will find him. Jeremiah shares in Jeremiah 29 verse 13 these words. If you seek me and find me you, when you search for me with all of your heart. You see, if you seek me, he says, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. It can't be a divided heart. Then Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah's a bad boy, y'all. Listen to what he writes. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I'm talking about joy to the world, unspeakable joy. But let's get ready to close this out. In verses 13 and 14, Luke shares with us heaven's pent up ecstasy over the birth of Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says. And it says, and then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Do you see the imagery? This is a beautiful picture. There's a single angel right now doing the announcing of the, the birth to come, right? But heaven couldn't hold its peace. And it just says, it just, an army of them shows up. <sighs> Somebody needs to say something. Heaven couldn't hold its peace. See, and it had to say something. And they said, glory to God in the highest. You see, Hebrews chapter one, verse six says it this way. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all of God's angels, what? Worship him. So when he came into the world, the angels had to come forth and give him praise. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill toward men. For it is through the atoning blood of Jesus that we find peace with God. Somebody needs to say something. For Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, these words, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now, you see, when we say goodwill toward men, that phrase means that people are the objects of God's goodwill. Isn't that beautiful? This is why it's a joyful moment in this experience. So those who believe and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will have this joy, this unspeakable joy. And you get it on day one of your faith. It doesn't come like six weeks later. Save up some postage stamps or something. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 says it this way, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. It's the second one, by the way. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. You get them all. You get them all. For Isaiah 9, 6, we touched it last week, gives us four key attributes about this child born unto us in this manger. It says that he is to be the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Wonderful Counselor. As we close, I need to want you to hold this thought in your mind. Let us remember that the joy that we have, the world did not give it to us. And if the world didn't give it to us, the world cannot take it away. And don't you dare lay it down and walk away from it. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time with your people. God, I pray that all that was shared here this morning was accepted in thy sight. Father, you are the everlasting Father, and you are so good. Let us truly embrace and hold on to the true meaning of Christmas, the whole struggle, the whole everything, everything that the mom and dad went through that you might be brought forth in the prophecy in which was spoken of. And now, Lord, let us continue to revel in the light and in the power and the strength of who you are, never forgetting what you've done and who you are to us in our lives. Let us live lives that are honoring before you. Let us be the ambassadors that you called us to be. Let us to be that salt and light in this dark world. Because wherever your true children stand, there's great light even in dark situations. 
Let them see you in us. And Father, we'll be forever careful to always remember to ask, give you all the praise and give you all the glory. And we ask these blessings, Father, in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Love you guys. Have an excellent week. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Continue to wear your mask. Wash your hands. Take care. Thanks.